Okay, I think we can get started now. Uh, thanks for coming for my session. So, looks like there are more Android developers in this conference than iOS developers. How many of you here have actually attended my, my the other session, my Android session? So, so, okay, so I can reuse my jokes. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Wei Meng. So, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about React Native, uh, how to use React Native to develop iOS applications. So, um, how many of you here are actually Xcode developers? Okay, one. How about the rest? Okay, since, since this is a small crowd, I think we can make, make this more interactive. So what is the main agenda for coming for this session? Are you a web developer, Windows developer, and you want to learn how to develop iPhone apps? Yes, okay, cool. You have come to the right place, and you will believe whatever I say. <laughs> okay, so, so if, if you're new to, to iOS development, let me just give you a very quick introduction. So if you want to develop native iPhone applications, you can use the tool provided by Apple, which is Xcode, and you use the language either Objective-C, which is a really, really painful language, or you can use the newer Swift programming language. So, but the, the problem here is that a lot of people uh, not only want to develop their apps for the iPhone platform, they want their apps to be able to run on Android devices as well. So people are looking for a cross-platform solution. So, so if you are a developer faced with this kind of requirements, it's always good to find a solution, a platform that allows you to write once, run everywhere. So React Native allows you to do that pretty easily. So, and that's the agenda for the next 60 minutes. I'm going to try to convince you to tell you that React Native is the best tool to write your iPhone apps. So my agenda is very straightforward. I want to get you started with React Native, and I will try to convince you why you should use React Native. And I will talk about these two features called Live Reload and Hot Reload. And I will show you how to perform common tasks uh, with React Native, things like location-based services, how to display maps, how to uh, create tab applications, navigation applications, um, how to persist your data using databases, so on and so forth. And I will show you some really cool things called live updates using code push. Now, what is React Native? So I am pretty sure most of you here are familiar with React for, for the web. So uh, React Native is actually based on React as well. It's a JavaScript framework for writing native iOS and Android application. Notice that I focus on the word native. Native meaning it is not running behind a web browser. It is a pure first-class application, first-class citizen on your iPhone devices. And as such, it doesn't have the usual uh, performance problems of hybrid applications, like you, you heard from your friends who are using things like Cordova, Ionic, so on and so forth. So it's based on React. And you write React native apps using a mixture of the following, JavaScript. Okay, so how many of you are, are, are new to JavaScript? Okay, good. I think everybody's fam familiar with JavaScript, right? So you guys love JavaScript. CSS. I, I don't think I need to introduce to you what is CSS, right? So, and then JSX. So JSX is basically a combination of JavaScript plus XML, also known as, or, or, or put it this way, in, in the past we call this spaghetti code. <laughs> but, but this is really cool, okay? So, so your React Native basically translates your UI markup uh, to native UI elements, and hence your app is a pure native app. Now, why use React Native? So this is the, I, I think to a lot of developers, this is the most important thing. Um, convince myself, convince my boss to allow me to use React Native. You can use it to write cross-platform apps. So for those of you who have actually downloaded the NDC application onto your iPhone or Android devices, um, I, I, I basically, basically wrote that application uh, using React Native, and 99% of the code is actually uh, running on both platforms. So in fact, just for one particular component, um, the, the rest of the code is, is basically write once, run on two platforms. So I don't have to really spend too much time trying to customize my app to look different on, on each platform. 
apart from one very simple uh, component. So your apps retain the native look and feel of each platform. So if you were to download the app, you run it on iPhone, it looks just like an iPhone app. If you download this on an Android device, it looks just like an Android application. So it's pure native, it's not hybrid, and it allows you to really efficiently test your app. So uh, when you want to make changes to your app, once you have deployed your app to your emulator, to your real device, you make changes to your JavaScript code, you save your code, the changes would automatically be reflected on the simulator or on the real device itself. There's no need for you to redeploy your application onto your device again, which is usually a time-consuming affair. So you can use this feature called live and hot reloading to instantly see the changes to your code. I'll, I'll show you a demo. And then it has very good community support. So the nice things about React Native is that it's open source. So if you need help, you can get help on the, on the web. Stack Overflow has got tons of discussion on this. And if you need a certain feature in your app and it's not available in React Native, you go to Google, you search for that, there is a package out there that can serve your requirements. So whatever you need, there's a package out there. And as the saying goes, there's a package for that. Okay, So whatever you want, somebody has uh, required that uh, sometime back. So you can also do a code push, meaning after you have developed your app, you deploy this to, onto your app store. And for those of you who have actually deployed on, on, developed on Xcode before, you, you, know, you know the nightmare, right? You deploy all your apps onto the app store, and then Apple takes, how long does Apple need to? Uh, four to 48 hours, yes. And I think that's pretty accurate. Nowadays, it's like, typically, you deploy today, tomorrow morning when you wake up, it's, it's approved, okay? And for those of you who have actually deployed applications before, you know that's the happiest moment in your life when your app is approved. <laughs> Do you agree? Just don't tell your wife. Okay? Don't, don't tell your wife that that's the happiest moment in, 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 in your life. So if your, if your wife asks you, say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, getting married to you is the happiest moment in my life. So. Okay, so, um, so using code push, what you can do is that the moment your app is approved on the App Store, the user is running your app, what you can do is that you can make changes to your code, send it to this server by, hosted by Microsoft called Code Push, and your, your, your users would be able to use your app and dynamically check for updates against the Code Push server, and then download the updated UI, and then run the updated application on your on your iPhone, and so this is something that is really, really cool. But as far as the App Store is concerned, this is something that is of a, a, a gray area, because um, depending, on, depending on how much, what did you change? If you say that this is a sports application, and after the update, this becomes an adult application, this is not going to be okay. Okay, so it, it, it's a little bit grayish here, so, You've got to be careful. But for, I think, minor bug fixes, minor UI updates, I think that's perfectly fine. So React Native is available as a uh, Node.js uh, package. So all you need to do is install Node.js on your machine, uh, NPM, and then install the CLI, and install this tool known as Watchman, which will continually monitor the changes in, in your code, uh, in, in your files, and then update your application when you make changes. So the best way to, to see how this works is to create an application. Okay, so let me just uh, delete this guy, and let me show you how to Okay, so let's, uh, oops. Try to create a new project, a React Native project. So React Native init, hello, NDC. And then you can always specify the version that you want to use. The, the, the good news of uh, React Native is that at this moment, it's not even in version 1.0. It's not even in 1.0. Who can tell me what's the latest version of React Native? Make a guess. 
47.1. So uh, why is this good news? Your potential employer can never, can now no longer ask you, do you have 10 years working experience with React Native? <laughs> okay. Man, that, that, that's the real world, right? They will always say we need a developer with 10 years working experience with C Sharp. So, now I got some versions with the latest version of my, my React Native, so I'm going to fall back on 0.44. So, but anyway, so I, I'm creating a new project. So let me just create that. So what happens here is that it is now creating a project. So my project is here. So it is going to create the project, create the node modules that I need for my project. And once this is done, let me open up the project and let me show it to you. Okay, so almost done. Okay, now, so this is the components, all the files that we have in our project. So let me just run through that very quickly. So I have a few folders, a few files. So the folder that is named Android is the source code for your Android Studio project. So if you are testing this on an Android device, simply use Android Studio, open up the Android folder, and that is your Android project. The iOS project, which is what we want to focus now, is in here. So if I double click on this, it will open up my Xcode. Okay, and this is basically an Xcode project. Now, the, the, the good news is that you don't really have to get your hands dirty with um, Swift or Objective-C. In this case, it's Objective-C. All you need to worry about is this, two, this file, index.ios.js. So this is your, your, your main page. So double click on that. Let's take a look. Now, as you can see, this is JavaScript. Now, before we run through this, let me just run my Xcode project, uh, deploy this onto my simulator. So I just put this one side. And my simulator is up and running. There you go. Hang on. No, I think I'm open. Let me close this guy first. They don't. Um, let me just close this project. Ah, uh, there you go. Um, I run. I'm running the wrong project. So let me just run this. So let me run through this. So basically, what I have here is that I have a React Native project. I have a component called Hello NDC, and I have a render function. So this render function basically renders your UI. And if you look at this, this is your very familiar HTML-like kind of uh, markup. So this whole block itself is called JSX, JavaScript extension. So it's a mixture of XML, and you can actually embed JavaScript code within this block of code. And so this is called JSX. So what actually happens behind the scene is that React Native would launch something called a Packager Manager, which is running behind the scene here. It basically converts your JSX into ES5 JavaScript, and this JavaScript is then, is then sent over to your iPhone application, and it will render the UI like a native application. So if you look at this part here, 
and you compare this with what you see on the simulator. Welcome to React Native, welcome to React Native, and so on and so forth. Now, what about making changes? So I want to make some changes to this, and I say, um, welcome to NDC. I can save this. And usually in Xcode, if you want to update your app after you have made changes, you, what do you do? You go back to Xcode, you redeploy, right? So on the iPhone, on, on React Native, you don't have to do that. You, all you need to do is Command R, it's updated. So my app is now updated. And on a real device, all you need to do is um, shake your device. And then you will bring up this dev menu, and you do a reload. And it will reload automatically. So there's no need to redeploy. And this feature itself saves you a lot of time when, you, when you're testing your, your application. And this is called live reload. Now, I can automate this process. I can do this. I can do a enable live reload. So if I enable this, all I need to do is I go back here and say, welcome to my session. And I do a save, and it is automatically refreshed. Are you, are you impressed? No. OK, never mind. OK, go back to your Xcode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a React Native. Let's continue. So, um, so this is the, the these are the steps to, to, to run your application. So you open up your open up your iOS project uh, in the iOS folder using Xcode, and then you select your iPhone simulator or your real iPhone and then run the project. And the packaging manager, which runs behind the scene, would automatically launch. And it would serve, and it will compile your JXX code, and then send it over to your iPhone application. So this is my hello world. Now, to enable reloading, you can do a command R on the simulator. You can do a reload. And for real devices, you basically just shake it. Now, so this is how React Native works. So it basically acts as a bridge between your, your JavaScript code and your iOS platform. So it basically con con converts your application from JavaScript into the JavaScript that the native application will be able to, to understand so that the application will be able to build the UI on the platform itself natively. Now, at this moment, React Native only supports iOS and Android. So uh, what about the other types of platforms? What other platforms are important? What other platforms are available today? For those of you who are mobile developers, right? Uh, besides iPhone, besides Android, what are the other mobile platforms that are? <laughs> Forget about Windows Phone. Tizen? Uh, Tizen. I think you can forget about Tizen as well. <laughs> um, tell me honestly, what, which are the devices running Tizen? Uh, the, watches the, um, the, the Samsung Gear 3, right? Yeah. The watches? Uh, OK. And, and who, who, who are we, who, how many of you are wearing Samsung watches? <laughs> Anybody? Take it out. Give it back to me. Uh, I, I, I think in India, there are certain models that are running. Samsung has got certain models in, in India that are running Tizen. But I think in terms of worldwide adoption, I think so far it's not really successful. Uh, maybe they will, but as a developer, I, I, I don't think that that's a formidable platform. I, I think for the primary reason, uh, developers are simply too tired. Uh, developers have enough of iOS and Android. If you give them one more platform, you'd kill them. OK? So uh, what else? Windows Phone, I think, unfortunately, Windows Phone is almost dead, still breathing, but 
you know, waiting for the final day, nail. <laughs> so, but um, somebody say, anybody say BlackBerry? <laughs> so now, uh, recently, some companies actually talked to Facebook about using React Native for their platforms. I think Microsoft is one of them, but not for Windows Phone. I think for their Windows platform, not for Windows Phone. And then the other company is Samsung. I, I believe Samsung for their TVs, I think. Their TVs. Okay. Now, so React Native actually gives us this promise, write once, run everywhere, right? And I, I'm sure as a developer, you are, you are very familiar with this. You, you heard this in 1995. Okay, uh, write once, run everywhere, right? But in, in reality, it's write once, debug everywhere. <laughs> so uh, so you, you remember this guy? That, that shows how, how, how old you are. <laughs> this is Java, right? This is the, the Java Duke. And this guy keeps on spinning, and then when they launch, when they first launched Java, they had this, this thing called Java Applets. And then the first demo that they created was this guy uh, jumping on the web page. Can you recall that? I, I, I was finishing my studies during those days, and then when we, when we first saw this, we were so excited. We don't even know what is Java. So we took some sample code, and then modify, and then me and my few friends, they say, let's start the company. Let, let's try to, to sell this Java technology, even though we don't know what the hell is it. <laughs> so let's try to sell this to businesses. So when we talk to businesses, we say, hey, we are now able to make sure your web page can bounce. <laughs> so, so we are too excited, but then we, we don't really know what to do with it. So, so in the end, we, 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 we didn't really create anything. And that's why I'm here today. So this is JSX. So JSX is basically a, a this is a better uh, representation of JSX. So it's basically XML plus a little bit of, if you look at this, JavaScript code. So when, we, when, I, when I first encountered JSX, my first impression of this was, this looks like ASP, Active Server Pages, right? You know, back in the ASP 1.0, 2.0 days, uh, we have a name for this, spaghetti code, right? So, so it's like, oh, everything comes back one big round. So. so you can combine your UI markup with JavaScript, uh, but you don't have to do this in React Native if you do not want this, if, if you do not, do not want to use JSX. Um, but using this will make your life much, much easier. Okay? So um, if you do not want to use JSX, this is how it looks like. You're going to write all the code for the UI elements, you have to create the elements yourself manually. But, but it, it, it all depends. Sometimes developers, certain developers got very high threshold for pain. They like coding, you know, so. Now, React Packager. So the React Packager basically converts the source code of your app. So it does the following. It transpiles your code from JSX to ECMAScript. It converts your code from ECMAScript 2016, also known as ES7, and ECMAScript 2015, also known as ES6 to ES5. So this is the package manager uh, in action. When you run your application, this is the packager manager. So it runs behind the scene, and it basically, it's, it's basically a, a web server application, and it basically serves the code the compiled code at this URL. And so if you were to use a browser, you click on this, punch in this link, you'll be able to see one whole bunch of JavaScript files, or JavaScript uh, classes. So this is your React Packager. Now, for those of you who have done uh, Xcode, um, Apple introduced this particular feature called Auto Layout. Heard of this? If you are an Xcode developer, there's no reason why you do not know Auto Layout. It's a pain in the back. Do, do you agree? Those of you who have done uh, Auto Layout, so it makes your life really, really difficult. Uh, why? Because you guys want to have big size, large screen sizes, so Apple will uh, in order to make customers happy, they have 
iPhones of different sizes, but then in the end, in, in the end who suffers? Developers suffer because developers must do extra work. I, I, I remember life was really, really peaceful up until iPhone 5. From the first iPhone to iPhone 4S, life was really peaceful because when you do your UI, it's either retina or non-retina display. That's it. One point translates to two pixels. Starting from iPhone 5, you got a lot of nightmares. Now, so uh, React Native doesn't use auto layout. It doesn't use constraint layout in Android. It uses something called Flexbox. And I think if you are a web developer, Flexbox is uh, pretty uh, straightforward. And like, like I mentioned, uh, um, if you think of auto layout, you will have typically this kind of reaction. And you, you know who, who is this guy, right? And I know you guys love him. <laughs> now, so to, to allow you to do your layout, uh, Flexbox offers the following three main properties. Uh, flex direction, justify content, align items. So let me just quickly go through the basics of Flexbox. So if you look at this, I have a view. So in this case, it represents the entire page. And within this view, I have a child, of, which is another view. And this first view has got the style container. So you apply the following attributes, justify content center, align item center. And I have a child which has got width 80, height 80, and the color is blue. Now, so in your head, can you try to visualize how does it look like? How does it look like? So I got a page, I got a square in the middle, right? Do you get this right? Okay, now, so this is easy. What about this? So now I have added in two more views. So what is it going to look like now? Before I tell you the answer. Now, by default, items in a container are arranged vertically in column format by default. So it looks like this now. Okay, so this is very much web-based, very, look, looks very much like a web uh, application. Now, how about if I change the direction to row? So remember the default is always a column. If I change this to row, it's gonna look like this. I can change the sizing, so I can specify a flex attribute. So I can have a flex one, flex one, flex one. So in this case, now without me showing you this, the, 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 look, the, the final look, can you, can you try to imagine how it's gonna look like? Do you get this right? So flex one basically means I want to occupy as much space as I possibly can. So, but in this case, you got three views here within the same container. It's, it's just, just like you buy a, a, a cake back home. If you are the only child, you can have the whole cake, right? And that's why they say you can have a cake and, and eat it too. So, but if you have a sisters or your, you have sisters or brothers, then you have to share equally among them, right? So in this case, um, because there are three, so they will split evenly. So, so this is the explanation. If you specify flex colon one, each view would have, uh, would take all the available space, but because there are three, so they will be divided equally. And in this case, even though I specify my width to be 80, but I have flex, it will override the attribute called width. Next one, I specify my flex direction to be column, and I specify flex one for each of the views, so it will look like this, okay? I can specify maximum width, so I can specify that in this particular first view, the maximum width is 90, so in this case, it will stop at 90 maximum, and because the rest have got flex one, so you will, they will divide the remaining space equally among the second and third view. Okay, 
Uh, what about flex one, two, three? So in this case, I am specifying the ratio. So, uh, so one is to two is to three. So if we were to run this, I'll get something like, like this. Okay, so quite easy to understand. Justifying content, if I were to specify flex one, flex direction column, justify content equal to flex start. So can you, can you imagine how it's gonna look like now? What does flex start mean? So, but this time around is column, okay? So column, so the three views would be aligned in a column fashion, and flex start means align to the top, start with the top. So it will look like what I have here, okay? So you need to take note of the following. You have a flex one for this view containing the three squares so that you can occupy the entire column. And then the justify content attribute basically indicates how its children should be justified. So in this case, flex start means you align to the top. And if you specify that the flex direction is set to column, then justify column affects the vertical alignment. Okay, so just think of this. Flex end, you have flex start, you have flex end, so flex end would look like this. Align to the bottom. Space around. If I have the flex direction, you go to column, and then I do a justify content space around, then I would have a equal amount of spaces for each view. Or I can have space between. And in this case, they would have the equal space for each view. Okay, the next important um, concept you need to understand is state and props. Now, rather than go through the items here, I think it's easier to show using an, an example. So let me just close off this application and load another demo. So let me just close off this guy and terminate this guy. And let's go to the spinner example, iOS, and let, let me open up this guy. And I'm gonna run this. Okay, so this is my application. So my application has got one button. So when I click on the button, the label on this button would change and you will, spe you will see a activity indicator spinning here. So I click on this guy, you'll see the activity indicator spinning. And then if I click on this button, it will stop, okay? Now, this is a very useful example to look at um, state and props. So let's take a look at this very simple code here. Now, first of all, I need to import all my uh, relevant uh, modules. So in this case, I have a spinner, my activity indicator. So I have to import this. Uh, touchable opacity is basically to allow you to have a some sort of like button so that when you tap, it changes the color. So that's under touchable opacity. And I have a component called my button. And basically, my button has got a single render function. This render function basically draws the UI. So my, my button basically draws a view. And inside this view, it has got a text. It has got a label. Now, what text is my button going to display? It is going to display this dot props dot label. So when I create my my button, I don't know what I want to display. So I'll leave it as this dot props dot label. So this dot props dot label 
is like your properties of your class. So when later on I use my my button, I want to specify the label. I will specify this through an attribute. I'll pass it in, and this is where I get my properties. And that's why they call this props. Now, a very good way to look at this is, is this. Look at this, my button. If you go down to this page here, you'll see my button here. And I specify label equal to something. And so this label is actually this dot props dot label. So now you understand why it's a props. Now, in my spinner class, I have a constructor and I create the following what we call states. States are basically variables, but states are really powerful because when you buy your state with your UI, the moment the value of your state changes, your UI would get automatically updated. So that's the real power of React Native. So I create two states here, animating, button label. So I create my state animating to be false, button label to be animate. So now, so this is how it works. I have an activity in, in indicator. This is the spinner. And it is whether it is initially spinning, it is determined by this dot state dot animating. Because I set to false, so when I first load my application, the spinner is not spinning. So it's, it's not visible. And my button has got this label. So button label is called animating. So the first time you run, you see something like this. Now, when I click on my button, when I click on my button, I go to this animate method. So this animate method is here. So I check if my current text for my button, my, my, my label for my button is animate, I will change it to stop animating else I will change it back to animate. So once I'm, I'm done with this, I do a set state. So I want to change the state, the, the value of the state variables that I have. So what, the moment I do a set state, it will automatically trigger a render and React Native would know which are the elements that needs updating. And it does so in a very efficient manner. So, and this is what happens. So if, when I click on this guy, it spins, and then when I'm done, it stops. And so to, to me, this is the main hurdle for people who are coming in from the Xcode background. When you come over to React Native, you just have to, to get used to the, the new paradigm of thinking, the new way of updating your UI. In, if you are familiar with Xcode, you are familiar with IB outlets. And you use outlets, you update your state, you use IB action, you trigger an action. But once you get past that stage, everything is pretty straightforward. And so, you understand what is states and state and props. So I don't have to go through this. Okay, so this is simple. Now, so now that we have covered the basics, um, for a lot of the developers who are coming into a new platform, especially for myself. When, when, I, when, I, when I try to learn React Native for the first time, I always tell myself, okay, I'm able to do the following things in Xcode. Tell me how can I do the exact same thing in React Native. And because I, I have a, a series of courses on iPhone development using Swift and Xcode, so I have a set of materials written using Swift. And I, and I set myself this challenge. Okay, I want to convert everything that I have into React Native and see how easy it is to, to, to do that. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to tell you what are, the, uh, how, what are the various ways to accomplish the common tasks that you will usually encounter when you write a mobile application. So I'll talk about some of the APIs available. And if the APIs are not available natively, how do you actually get the packages on the internet? Okay. 
So um, this list shows the native components in React Native. And you have things like activity indicator, you have button, blah, blah, blah. So all those that has got a suffix of iOS, it's only available for iOS. All those for Android, is only available for Android. All those that does not have the iOS and Android suffix are cross-platform. Because I'm running out of time, so I, I want to um, skip through some of the things and show you the really interesting stuff. So um, the first thing that developers always ask is that I, I want to be able to display a list of items. So uh, if you are familiar with Xcode, you would no doubt be familiar with table view, UI table view. Okay? Now, in, 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 in React Native, you use this thing called section list. Section list is useful if you need to display your list items, break them down into sections, and then you want to display headers. So the NDC app that I have is created using section list. But if your requirements is much simpler, you don't need to break them down into sections. You can use what we call flat list. So the same application under the speakers tab, it is created using a flat list. So flat list is much more uh, easier to, to implement and it is also much more efficient. Now, if you want to get locations, you can use the Joe Location API and you just need to add your required, the required permissions to your Xcode project or your Android projects and then it will allow you to actually get your locations, your latitude, longitude. So this is one example. Now, just for my information, if you want my slide, you just, um, if you can, just send me an email and then I'll, I'll email you the slides so you don't have to worry about the, 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 the code here. Even the display maps. So, um, this took me quite a while to, to, to find the correct solution. So, the, the best way to display maps in a React Native application that's cross-platform is use the component from Airbnb. So, you look for React Native maps. So, it's the cross-platform solution and it automatically uses uh, Apple Maps for iOS, and it uses Google Maps for your Android applications. And for, Andro Google, for Android applications, you have to apply for the Google Maps API key. Just take note of that. And typically, this is a, these are the steps to install a third-party component. You CD into a project name, in, into a project folder, and you install using NPM, whatever modules you want to use, link that with your project, so that the required libraries are added into your iOS project, your Xcode project, as well as your Android Studio project. So it, it works for most of the components that you find on the web. Um, so this is pretty useful to, to take note. So this is how it looks like. Data storage, you can make use of the async storage. So uh, the equivalent of this in Xcode is your user defaults. User defaults. So Async storage is pretty efficient. So if you have a lot of key value paths that you want to save, you don't have to worry about opening up files, databases, and so forth. Use async storage. But if you want to store structured data, you can use a SQLite, and there is a package out there, React Native SQLite storage, that allows you to store your data in SQLite databases. Networking. Um, if your app doesn't have networking features, then it's basically quite a useless app. So every app needs to talk to the outside world. So you can use the Fetch API, supported natively in React Native. Uh, it returns a promise object, it's asynchronous. Or if you want, you can use the XML HTTP request API. Or you can use WebSockets. Uh, there are also third-party modules available. Socket.io is one of them where you can actually use socket IO, uh, sockets to actually connect to your backend server. Navigation, a lot of times uh, people need to, to write applications that has got tab pages, uh, navigation applications, so on and so forth. So for, for navigation applications, you can use the React navigation. So this is the recommended framework to use. So I have one very simple example here. So I have uh, three tab pages. And for the second tab, I can click on this button and it will navigate to the next page. And then I can click on the back button, it will go back to the previous page. So, okay, so for this one, let me just show you a demo. Let me show you a demo um, so that you can see how it looks. Okay, so 
using navigation. So iOS. Okay. Close this guy. Okay, and then let me run this. Okay, so it's uh, okay. So I have three tab pages, and for the second tab page, I can click on this button. It will go to the next page. It will navigate to the next page, and then I can click on the back to go back to my previous page. So you can use React navigation. So I'm going to skip through this, this part here. And I want to show you something that is pretty cool. Um, that is called uh, dynamic app updates using code push. So basically, what you, you do here is that you register your application with code push. So code push is a cloud service that enables Cordova and React Native developers to deploy apps updates to their users' devices after they have been deployed to the App Store or Google Play. So, so this is what happens. So you deploy your apps to your users' uh, devices, and then once the users are running your application, you, this is you. Uh, the, re the reason why I use a picture of a ninja is because you're trying to bypass Apple and Google. <laughs> okay, I should change this to a politically more correct uh, picture. So anyway, so you make changes to your code, and then you push it up to code push, and then the, your, your application could actually be programmed to automatically check against code push for a newer version, or you could have a button in your app to say, click on, on, on this button to check for updates. Okay, so let me try to show you a demo. Okay, let me just close off my current project. And, um, okay, so my app is called My Dynamic App. I've already registered my, my application with Code Push. I have all the keys necessary, and then I can now deploy this application. So, iOS. And let me deploy this. onto my simulator. After this session, there's a, there's a party, right? Okay, so let me finish this before you get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so is this running? Okay, okay. Just bear me for five minutes if you can. Drunk yeah, he 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 just couldn't wait. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so this is my application running from my packager manager here, all right? So if I were to do a refresh, okay. Okay, wait, hang on. Uh, the reason is because I, I have already selected my scheme to be released. Okay, that's good. Okay, now uh, let me explain to you. If I set this to debunk, the scheme to be debunked by default, Let me just open up my project again. Sorry. 
if I, by default, when you create a React Native application, you deploy this onto your iPhone or iPhone simulator, by default, the scheme is always debug. Debug basically means when you run, the application is going to load from your packager manager. Okay? And how do you actually verify this? No, I think it's, let me just, okay, let me just close this guy, okay. And then that should work again. Okay, there you go. Now, how do you verify? If you look at the green bar up there, it means that this application is loading the, the, the application from from your packager manager. And then if you do a command R, you are able to refresh directly from packager manager. But so this is useful when you are when, when your device is actually connected to your Mac. But then a lot of times you want to deploy your application onto your device, disconnect your device, and go out for test. So in this case, if you do not want to load from the packager manager, all you need to do is go back to your Xcode project, go to product, go to scheme, edit scheme and change that to released. So when you change that to release, they are not gonna load that dynamically. What they're gonna do is that they're gonna package everything, deploy that onto your iPhone or iPhone simulator, and then you can disconnect and go out for your test. So it's gonna take a little bit more time to compile. So let me just run this once. And in the meantime, we want to go in here and look at my index.ios.js project. And I want to change some UI. Okay, let me just run the, finish running this and then so it's clearer. Okay. 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 So my application has got the following text, welcome to React Native iOS, yo, yo. So I'm going to go in here and let's just imagine that this app has been deployed on the App Store. It's now running on a user's phone. And you realize that, oh, you, should you shouldn't have this text here because you copy everything from Stack Overflow without modifying your UI. So you go back, change this, save, and how do you actually push that to your user? So you do this, there's a command here, which let me just copy this, and I'm just gonna run this, and my dynamic app, push it. So what I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do now is that I'm actually pushing my updated code to code push so that later on, my user can actually go to my, his application, click on this button, check for updates, and he will be able to actually see the, the updated app. So, so my app is now running. Okay, so it's pushing this. Okay, done. So, if the user were to click on this guy, he should see a, a dialog. So there's an update. Would you want to like to, would you like to install it? So, install. There you go. So the, the app is, is now updated. Are you, are you impressed? Okay, now you can go and get drunk. <laughs> so, so, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so you just need to, to download this component called React Native Code Push, and in your in your in your code, you can have a button, and if the user clicks on this button, you basically call this block of code to check for updates, and then you can 
you can update. You can also do additional things like um, you can roll back your updates, you can roll back to the previous version, roll back to the previous end versions if you want to. So check the document documentation for code push. Now, um, I only left with four minutes, but okay. So I, I think I have a few slides and then we are done. Now, if you are using React Native to, to write uh, platform specific code, or, or rather uh, cross platform code, there are certain things that you can use to detect for specific platforms. So you can use the platform module to know which version of OS your user is currently on. So you can know that using platform.os, or, or, or rather this is the, uh, the OS name, this is the version name, whether Android, iPhone, uh, whether 10.3, or whatever version you have. You can also use that in your style sheet. So you check if my platform is OS is equal to iOS, my font size set to 20, else set to 50. I can also do that this way. I can say that platform.select, if my platform is iOS, I want to have this uh, item called background color yellow. If this is Android, background color blue. Okay, last but not least, something fun. So uh, I'm not too sure whether you, have, whether you have heard of this thing called gifted chat. So gifted chat is a, is a module that allows you to back build your chat UI. So the history behind this NDC application that I have created is, this app was previously created for another conference, uh, DevTeach in Canada. So when I was building that application, I wanted to incorporate something fun. So I thought that people who are using my app would want to have a way to chat real time with fellow attendees. So imagine you got 50 of you in, in a session and you want to talk to your fellow attendees about um, the feedback about this session. So you, you would go in here and you will be able to chat with one another. So I wanted to build a chat UI, but at the same time, I wanted this to be cross-platform. So I was looking around and I finally stumbled across this thing called gifted chat. And the chat UI looks very much like your messenger UI or your um, message app on your iPhone. And, and it's really easy to use. And, it, and, and coupled this with socket IO and a couple of other modules, I'm able to create a chat application that allows people to chat real time. But I, in the end, I didn't incorporate this feature into the NDC app because I realized developers don't like to talk to each other. <laughs> in the <laughs> DevTeach conference, nobody wants to use this feature because they say, why should I talk to a, a fellow developers? <laughs> so I think they prefer drinking beer. So, <laughs> so, so. So, but I thought that was a very, very cool feature. But in, so in the end, it's like I said, okay, forget it. It's a good feature, but I'm going to leave it out of the NDC application. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but so, so for this time round, I'm not adding this feature into the app. Probably, hopefully, for the next NDC app, I'm going to add this feature and see, see the response. So, okay, so I, I, I think I'm done. So the timing is just perfect. Uh, questions, any, any questions? Before I let you go. Sure. <laughs> Is there any Angular native? Not that I know of. No. <laughs> Anybody who is familiar with Angular can, 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 can answer that question? Angular native? No, no. There, there is a, there is a, there's a utility running in the background called Watchman. Watchman. Um, not too sure whether you, you remember this slide that I, I showed you earlier on. Um, there you go. Watchman. This is the guy that is constantly, constantly monitoring the changes in your, in your file system. And then if you make some changes in your file system and it, it will be smart enough to know, oh, okay, that involves changes to the app, it will automatically push the changes back to the application itself. 
it actually causes the uh, packager manager to recompile the thing again. Yep, it does that. So, so if, if you're a chance to try this, you go and make some changes in your, in your code, you will look at your packager manager again, you'll realize that they are reloading that all over again. So that's the magic behind the scene. Okay, so I, I think I shall not hold you back anymore, but if you've got questions, I'll always be around, and then uh, I'll, I'll be around tomorrow as well. So thank you very much.